It's been a couple of really rough weeks, it sounds like, from the prayers and concerns. Thankfully, we have some very good news this morning. Our scripture reading comes from chapter 9 of Genesis. In the previous chapter, the flood has subsided. And now God speaks to us, promising to never destroy the earth again. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every other animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every other living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, if you would please. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This, as you just heard, is the conclusion to that classic children's Bible story, Noah and the Ark. With the rainbows and the animals and the doo ba doo and the we all hang pictures of the animals going into the ark, you know, from in our in our nurseries around our babies' cribs and everything, and then before the rain comes down, you know, and uh, covers the earth, and the floods are so bad, and every, everybody, everybody, <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? Are you kidding? This is how is this a children's story? Debbie, we have some serious redecorating to do in the nursery. <laughs> this is not exciting. And this is. And as a pastor, you think I would have noticed that before. This is really rough. And yet, it feels strangely normal to us. There's a rainbow, and there's a flood, and most of the world dies, and then these people come out, and here we are. The covenant with Noah. Um. Well, let's take a crack at it. Here's what led up to Noah and the ark. Um, things got bad. We're just, by the way, nine chapters into the entire Bible. So we got bad fast, to be clear. Um, uh, you have the two chapters in Eden, and those were really nice. Eden even means delight. So to give you a clue what it was like there, probably delightful. And then chapter three, things go downhill. Bad, 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 downhill. And then it's like this. Uh, there is violence, and there's greed, and there's this really weird chapter where, like, these angelic-type creatures procreate with humans and make this weird, scary race. I don't know what to do with that chapter, but it's in there, and you should read it. Um, and then there's even these things where, like, herbivore animals start getting a little bit bloodthirsty. I don't know if you do that either, but I assume it means creation has gone downhill fast, in five chapters or less. And so God grieves, it says, over the ruin of Eden. And then God decides to directly translate it, you ready? To destroy the destroyer. To destroy the destroyer. And that's the flood story. And now today's passage is just immediately after that flood. And we have something that has been known, and it's, been, it's typically been called the Noahic Covenant. 
Uh, a little neat thing you need to know about covenants, there are several in the Bible. If you just add the letters I, C, to uh, whoever God's making the covenant with, you got the name of the covenant. So this is with Noah, it's the Noahic covenant. There's one earlier in the Bible, about chapter 3, it's really the fall with Adam and Eve and the sin and the bad stuff. And the covenant is really with Adam and Eve, but traditionally it's been called the Adamic covenant. You see what that, it, you know, it could also be the Adamic and Eve. Even, even, well, it doesn't work, that's why. Um, then you have the Noahic covenant, that's the one today on the hills of the terrible flood. And then um, later, chapter 12, you've got the Abrahamic covenant. Um, that's that one, it's pretty famous. It's, it's the, uh, the, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, so that it will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and all will be blessed through you. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And then you have the Mosaic Covenant. As you might have guessed, it's with Moses. Uh, that's the one where Charlton Heston stands on Mount Sinai with the, the, the Ten Commandments. Um, the, the sort of meaning there is God is making, God is saying, listen, you're my people, and there's a way I want you to live because I'm going to tell my story through how I interact with you, and here are some ways to live. And that's kind of where the commandments fall in. Um, and then you've got uh, the, the sort of last major one is the covenant with David. Anybody got a guess on what that one's called? Davidic, he nailed it, that's right, the Davidic covenant. And that one is this one you see in 2 Samuel, you see in a few places actually. It's this promise that the Messiah would come through the line of David. This, this saving anointed one would come and save the people. These are the covenants. Now why is this one special? The Noahic covenant, because I do think it's very, very special. Um, there's some things we need to recognize. This is really early in sort of the way humans were interacting with or understanding how they interacted with God. <coughs> and what we need to recognize is that there was really a hint in these early stories uh, that God was against the people of the world. After the flood, it very much felt like God was against punishing, even oppressing these people of the world. Because remember, we had those two chapters where everything was perfect, but then after sin came in, in chapter 3, um, that, well, that, that first covenant, the Adamic covenant, that's the one that, that well, it says all the, the really rough stuff about how it's going to be hard to eat, to gather food, to farm. It's, it's going to, um, there's going to be pain in childbearing, which is why in the middle of Debbie's contractions, I mean, for and said, had you not sit in the garden, it wouldn't be like this. <laughs> I just want to be clear, I did not say that. <laughs> that was a joke, and we will not be studying that in the marriage group next week. It will be a bad decision. Um, anyway, the point is, that was, that was terrible. Um, the point is this, uh, for those first few chapters, like, well, I just got to think, even right before this no way covenant, right? Um, uh, for, you know, 99.99999% of the world, it seems like that decision was pretty punishing. Seems like it was a pretty terrible thing. That's what I mean by against. Sort of some rough times early on there. Also, you should know that one of the general images of God, this is not really necessarily just for the Hebrews that you do find it, um, but this is for like Mesopotamian people all around them. A general understanding was this idea of, of, of God as, as sort of more like, this is a true statement, uh, almost like Zeus. Uh, God would shoot arrows, take bows and arrows, and the, the arrows were lightning, okay? But it was this idea of God sort of taking aim at the earth. That would have been an arrow, a worldwide flood. That would have been quite an arrow, taking aim at the earth, because the earth had wronged God. That was sort of the idea. And then God makes a covenant with Noah. And do you notice... I'll just read a few of these. It says, uh, as for me, this is God, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you, with your descendants, every descendant after you, with every living creature, with the, the birds, the domestic animals, everyone who came out of the ark with you, which I guess leaves the fish sort of in limbo. I don't know, it's technical, it's not my, sorry, I can't say. Um, I establish my covenant with you. I will never cut off all life by flood. I will never destroy the world by flood. And uh, something I need you to notice, did you see all the things that Noah had to say there? Did you see the part where Noah was like, I know and you solemnly swear to you? There's not that part. Noah says nothing. This is God coming to Noah, to all of creation, actually. 
and saying, this is my covenant with you, say nothing in return, I make this commitment to you for no reason besides I said so. That's a different kind of covenant. There are no stipulations, this is a blank check. This is a statement in the midst of having a name for being a God that seems to be sort of against these people, at odds with this world. This is a covenant that says, no, I am for you. Despite anything you might do, I am for you. And then, are you ready for this? That rainbow, that bow? Well, here's how it was understood. That suddenly, that bow, that bow that you would shoot arrows, you would shoot lightning from, God hung in the sky, aimed away from the earth, as if to say, our war is done. I'm not against you. I will hang up my weapons of war. Nothing, you are not under the gun. I am for you. So that rainbow means a little something. Besides the entire spectrum of light, what would you do? It means that too. You see, what people want to know when they talk about religion, by the way, does what you do mean something to everybody? Are we all in the same, we all in the same science class? Okay, I just want to make sure. When people talk about religion, when people visit a church, when people walk into a place like this, they want to know uh, some answers to some questions. Almost 100% of the time, if they walk into a congregation and do not feel loved, they really don't care what your God has to say or what you have to say about your God. What they want to know is, does God love me? Is God actually interested in healing the wounds of this world? That's the question people are dying to have answered. We answer a lot of questions in church, but that's really what people want to know. And right now the question might be for us, does this Lenten season of giving up chocolate have anything to do with God's love? Or our love for the world? Does it? There's that line that we shared on Ash Wednesday. As we passed the ashes on one another's foreheads, we said, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I will have you know that that is a direct quote from that covenant back at Adam and Eve. It seemed to be a reminder after they had sinned that, listen, you came from dirt and you're going back to dirt. It's not the most hopeful thing in the world. It's a reminder of our reality. And then, with Noah and all creation, there seems to be this statement of, I am not at war with you. I'm actually for you. And then, with Abraham, there's this promise that I will not only be for you, but I will bless the entire world through you. And then, there's this story with Moses. If you live this way, if you live this way, we'll tell a better story, because I want to tell my story of love for the entire world through you and your people and how I interact. And then there's this thing with David, this promise that I will send a very special Messiah to save this world through you. Now, the expectation throughout their history was that this Davidic king, this King David, would have somebody in his line that would be a new king, and that king would sort of probably forcefully take back this nation for the uh, people of Israel, and, and that was not, you know, hard to imagine because there were plenty of people to take it back from. They were in exile plenty, they were under they occupation plenty, and there was a lot of messes, and so they dreamt of this Davidic king, this Messiah, to come and save them. With each of these, uh, with each of these promises, these covenants, if you'll notice, God gets closer and closer and more involved and more involved, and you might even say more vulnerable and more vulnerable as God is intertwined with the human with human God. But this last one sort of takes the cake. Because it isn't a king that comes in, not like they were expecting. Matter of fact, instead of God sending someone, God sends God's self. And walks among us and makes the ultimate gesture of vulnerability. Instead of reminding us that we are death, instead of saying, don't forget that you're dust, God joins us in the dust, walks with us, wears the same dust we wear, and does so all the way to the cross. So, from Ash Wednesday to Easter morning, we will walk through Lent together. We will start with our fall with our mistakes, with a reminder that from, uh, from dust we came, and dust is where we will go. And then we will walk through
through all of Lent, reflecting on ourselves, but never forgetting that God had made a very serious promise. And that promise is that I will do anything necessary to get this message across to you that I am for you, I am with you, and I love you. So this walk from Lent begins with from dust to dust, but it ends with I came to give you life and give you life abundant. God really does love us to answer that question that everybody's asking. God walked this Lenten road too, and God walks this road with us. Amen? Amen.